Welcome back to the Hard Run Box podcast. We have an episode where we're talking about a hot topic. Is 30 FPS gaming unplayable? We do a bit of a deep dive there coming at it from multiple different angles and just discussing our experiences with low frame rate gaming and the benefits of playing at higher frame rate. So stay tuned. Fair few interesting things to get to in this one. Let's get straight to it. Steve, we're back for another podcast episode. Lots of interesting things to talk about this week. I'm kind of keen for this one. Uh, How are you doing? Good. Well, I have a question for you. Yes. What number are we up to? You have to Uh, get it right. If you get it wrong, you got to delete the whole episode. Oh, now I've got in my notes here that it's episode 11, but I'm not sure whether that's true because I don't always update it. So So you're going to go with 11 or you're going to sort of bump up to 12 maybe? I think it's 11. I think okay. last week was episode 10, right. but I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Does it really okay. matter? Um, it matters to me, Tim, so it'll matter to someone else out there, I'm sure. I guess once we hit 12, we've been doing it for three months, so maybe that's maybe that's a milestone. Who knows? It's, it's a milestone <laughs> of sorts. I think we might have missed one. Oh, no, I think we did it late. Anyway, let's get into it, whatever it is that yeah. we're getting into. Let's get into it. So first, I wanted to talk about very, exci- very, very exciting stuff. Super exciting that you'll be very interested it's in, not Steve. not more comments, is it? No, no, no. Okay, it's, good. it's on the the new Apple M3 SoC. Oh, so I've I hate got, you so much. <laughs> I've got a list here of all the things that I found super exciting about this launch. So are you ready? I'm just going to read out the list for you right now. And that concludes the list. Okay, good. So, we're so not let's talk- move on. Well, yeah, okay, good. I, I, I was like, you've made me talk about frame generation. Then you've read out ridiculous comments. I'm like, the only way it can go further downhill and get worse is if we talk about Apple products. I'm, I'm glad we're not doing that. <laughs> to be fair, I did briefly look at some of the, because obviously our Discord community was sort of going off about some of the, the Apple announcements. And I sort of briefly had a look. I'm like, oh, is there anything interesting here? And then within about one second, I was like, no, is the, mm-hmm. <laughs> is the answer to mm-hmm. that. So no, I thought maybe maybe they'd launch some more gaming type stuff. I think if Apple takes more of a path into gaming, then maybe they'd be like, "Hmm, Could be am I slightly interested now?" Mm-hmm. But no, they're just they're just making their standard stuff. So mm-hmm. we'll get into the main topic that we wanted to to discuss today. Something that, as you said earlier, is sort of a comment that we keep getting, and a comment on the latest Alan Wake Two video that we did comparing the two lower end parts to see how they would perform. So I went and I had a look at the RX 5700 XT. I looked at the Titan X Pascal and I also looked at the RTX 2060 Super to see, yeah, basically what sort of experience you can expect to get on these cards based on, you know, Turing supporting mesh shaders, those older GPUs not supporting mesh shaders. Is there a big difference in performance? And generally I came to the conclusion that, yeah, the 5700 XT was definitely unplayable delivering mm-hmm. performance below 30 fps the 2060 super was noticeably better like significantly better but still wasn't really giving a decent experience often in the sort of 40 fps range using 1080p low settings that sort of thing mm-hmm. and then yeah the, the titan x pascal was was very bad and one of the comments that we got a lot on the video was this i guess a criticism of me saying when i said 30 fps is unplayable people being mm-hmm. like well you know this is a slower paced single player title therefore 30 fps is acceptable and i think both of us have some pretty strong feelings about that because i strongly disagree with that comment and i imagine that you would even strong more strongly disagree with that yeah i well in general i would it's it is it is very much a depends type topic now for me personally i would not play the game at 30 fps i find it very jarring unenjoyable Mm -hmm. uh, and i would rather play like the original game or or something else i would rather play a less demanding game that my hardware that limits me to 30 fps and alan wake 2 you know i can get 60 90 whatever fps in a different game Mm -hmm. so that's my stance on it there's just so many different ways to approach this subject all right so Mm -hmm. typically we're reviewing new hardware And more recently, new hardware has been expensive. So if you're reviewing, I don't know, an RTX 4060, for example, and it's $300 or a 4060 Ti and it's $400, you want better than even like 60 FPS with reasonable quality settings in a lot of these games. Mm -hmm. And the reason you can... Now, you can have a completely different discussion and argue about why we're not seeing that, you know, 
game optimization will come up quickly with gamers and you know there's probably a lot of truth to that with certain titles but also this generation of gpus does suck like we've said from day one it didn't really move the needle forward unless you're going to spend 1600 dollars us or whatever it costs now for an rtx 4090 but there's the whole you know the the performance we're getting out of the new products so again if you're spending if we're talking about 30 fps on hardware that's relatively new relatively expensive then my opinion is yeah it's completely unsatisfactory that's a crap experience if you're investing that kind of money that is not the experience that you deserve or should be getting so there's that part of the conversation to be had and then there's the the low spec gamer so someone who's got a 5600 g and they're Mm -hmm. trying to play like Fortnite or whatever it may be at 720p at 30 to 40 fps and i think a lot of people take those a lot of people who are in that camp, the, the the ultra budget gamer, take those 30 FPS comments to heart. And I think that's probably the bulk of the pushback is coming from that audience who are, yep. they almost feel personally attacked because they're like, look, I don't have a ton of money to spend on this. I'm doing what I can. I'm you know, making the most of it. I'm enjoying these games at 30 FPS, which is fine. And, and you're not really going after those people. Uh, and I guess when you're looking at older products like a 5700 XT, you sort of could be. But it's also, as you're probably going to mention, a subjective measurement as well. So it's yeah. I mean, that's that's my. Um, I guess the the first point that I wanted to make is that, mm. you know, provided that the game launches and you can enter the actual game doesn't crash or something like that or says it's mm-hmm. unsupported, the, any FPS is technically playable. Like it, you are playing the game even if it's running at 10 FPS or 5 mm-hmm. FPS. Mm-hmm. So. It, it, to say something is unplayable, it sounds like it's a non-subjective metric, like it either plays or doesn't play. So something that doesn't play is unplayable. But I guess the way that people typically use it and the way certainly that we've been using it in videos is more of a subjective description. We're sort of assigning below 30 FPS or around 30 FPS gaming to be unplayable. And as Mm -hmm. you say, depending on the type of gamer that you are and the type of hardware that you have Mm -hmm. that subjective cutoff point is going to vary quite significantly anywhere from 30 fps being playable if you do have as you say lower end hardware to 30 fps being unplayable if you've got an rtx 4090 because obviously you haven't bought that product for 30 Mm -hmm. fps gaming Mm -hmm. so yeah it's interesting seeing comments being like you know i disagree with your statement that 30 fps is unplayable i consider 20 fps to be unplayable as if that's somehow more correct than what I was saying, when really both of those statements are still subjective. subjective. <laughs> yeah. So when I say like, I strongly disagree that 30 FPS is playable, that's coming from my perspective and my, it's basically just an opinion, right? Like I don't really enjoy playing games at 30 FPS. Mm-hmm. So to me, that's unplayable. But technically, technically speaking, it is still playable. That's right. By my standards, I played a bit of Alan Wake at 30 FPS and it is a, fairly slow paced game at least the portion of the game that i played and it was technically playable so in that sense you are wrong but by my standards it wasn't playable because it was not enjoyable and you're playing a game to enjoy the game and Mm -hmm. i couldn't enjoy it like it was torture for me playing that game at 30 fps it was awful and i get that it's not a fast paced shooter but still, I guess where you, you would be right is stuff like Call of Duty, Fortnite, Apex Legends, mm-hmm. Rainbows, any any competitive shooter, 30 FPS is unplayable in the sense that you, know, you can still play the game, but it's unplayable in the sense that you're not going to beat someone of a similar skill level with many more frames. So, yeah, exactly. You, know, you, you, you saw a clip of Balan and I 1v1ing in Fortnite, and I think I was beating him about, I don't know, 70 to 80% of the time. Mm-hmm. But if you let him play how he normally plays and you cap my frame rate at a solid 30 FPS, I'll probably win maybe one or two out of 10 rounds. So it'll completely flip the stats on their head. And for it's me, a that becomes sure. it's a massive handicap. So, you know, it's still technically playable. I'm still playing the game, but I'm I'm playing at nowhere near, you know, my skill level. Even if I spent a long time trying to get used to 30 FPS and doing flick shots at 30 FPS. It'd be still be a massive handicap and very difficult to play the game. So I think it really is fair to say that for competitive shooters, 30 FPS is unplayable. And really, 60 FPS is questionable. And some people will be just shocked by that. But 
you know, because uh, we do see people say that, you know, 30 to 90 or, or sorry, sorry, from 60 to 90 or from 60 to 120, it's not that different, which I find just absolutely absurd. It's like saying daytime is not that different to nighttime in terms of mm-hmm. how many lumens there are. Um, it's a complex subject that you can come at from many different angles, but in we, we but we both agree that 30 FPS in Alan Wake is not a good time. It's not a good experience. And mm-hmm. if you're playing it at 30 FPS and you're doing that because, well, either you have to or you're just happy with that, I guess if you're happy with it, more power to you. And if you have to play at 30 FPS and you're really enjoying the game, don't take it personally. It's kind of nice to know that there's a much better experience to be had. So for, for me personally, that sort of information... It inspires me to either save up and upgrade my... Like, that was always the exciting thing for me, was making your computer better. Back when I, I almost enjoyed PC building and PC gaming more when I was on a budget. It was so much more exciting. Like, yeah, every was. upgrade was exhilarating. It was amazing when you got a bit more performance. I remember when I'd upgrade my graphics card from, like, a low-end one to a slightly less low-end one, and it was just insane. And then you'd, you'd tune the settings and overclocking the bias back when overclocking was actually somewhat meaning well very meaningful really that was fun these days it's just it, it there's not as much fun when you can afford high-end high mid-range type hardware so if you're playing at 30 fps and you know you're enjoying it but you'd like it to be a bit smoother yeah i, I wouldn't be i I don't know. I, I don't even know what it is that they are. Is it personally attacked, offended? I wouldn't be that if someone was saying there's a better experience to be had. I'd be inspired and excited to hear that and go, okay, well, that's that's something to look forward to. I'll work a bit harder or, or save a bit longer or whatever it is and upgrade my computer and I'll unlock that better experience. Um, of course, on the flip side, there's the whole thing that current generation hardware kind of sucks and yeah, so that, yeah. that's kind of, that's kind of a buzzkill, <laughs> bit of a downer, but yeah, my yeah. point is, don't feel personally attacked when someone's opinion, their subjective opinion, is that 30 FPS isn't playable. Because if you find it playable and you're happy with it, there's really nothing to be said, is there? You could apply that discussion to like a lot of different topics in life at the moment, like. Yeah. Yeah, someone else's opinion being different to yours doesn't necessarily mean that one opinion is better or more valid or wrong or or whatever well, the case subject- is. And it's not nothing to be offended over. It's just an like it's just an opinion. <laughs> but anyway, yeah, it's uh, like it's like subjects that guys always like talk about as cars. Like Balin just got a really nice new car, and yeah. you know it's really cool and that. But Tim's like, eh. He's like, I'm happy with my 30 FPS car. He's like, it does everything I want. Gets me from A to B. I could afford a better car, but I'm just not getting a better car because I don't care. I'm happy with what I've got. Yeah, and- I, mean, I like the Bale's car looks cool. Your car yeah. looks cool. They're, they're yeah. definitely much better than the car I have. Like, I'm not sitting here saying like, your car is as good as my but car. But you're not offended. Not true. No, but no, you're no, not no. offended by the fact that, you know, Bale's like, Subjectively, I think my car's better. You're like, yeah. well, let me go on a rant now and tell you how that's just not the case. It's mm-hmm. just, you know, you either you either buy what you're happy with or what you can afford or whatever. And if that's all you can afford and you've you're able to enjoy that, then yeah, that's great. We're not saying that it's not a put down type situation where we're like, you should be ashamed of your setup or you should be disappointed with it. You know, to spend mm-hmm. more money. It's not. It's not that. It's just yeah, yeah. So, and a lot of a lot of this is coming from a place where we're trying to either get games better optimized, or really from our end, get you better hardware to play the games. Is really what we generally that that's the angle we come at it from. Um, yeah, I mean so, that, that video was talking about hardware that was four to seven years old. Like, yeah, it's a bit different if we were going and saying like oh, we're turning on path tracing and you've bought a 4070 and it doesn't work and it's 30 FPS, so you've bought garbage yeah. hardware. It's a bit different from that discussion. But yeah. I think as well with the 30 FPS thing, there's different levels of 30 FPS as well. Like mm-hmm. in the Alan Wake 2 video with the 5700 XT, you weren't even getting like a consistent, smooth 30 FPS. There were yeah. frequent dips below 30 FPS. There wasn't too much stuttering, but there was some occasional performance dips and, and drops and things like that. And when you're at 30 FPS, any drops in frame rate, you know, to 28, 27 <laughs> FPS is pretty noticeable. It's all the more jarring. Yeah. So you're already getting like a fairly low level of performance. So anything lower than low is is obviously quite a bit worse. Whereas, you know, 
often a discussion is around, you know, consoles play games at 30 FPS. Therefore, you know, how could 30 FPS be unplayable? Because consoles, plenty of people play games at 30 FPS on consoles. But often the difference between a PC 30 FPS and a console 30 FPS is when we say PC 30 FPS, we mean like average around 30 FPS, which might mean fluctuations above and below that. Whereas on consoles, it means a locked 30 FPS. And a locked 30 Mm -hmm. FPS, I personally would still class that as unplayable or close to unplayable. Unenjoyable. It's better than average 30 fps where you're sort of around that mark and things are fluctuating and dipping and it can also depend on things like do you have motion blur enabled or disabled 30 fps with motion blur disabled is a slideshow 30 fps with motion blur enabled or no option to turn off motion blur does appear a bit smoother it doesn't necessarily make the game better or it doesn't lower the latency. That's certainly one aspect, but there's all sorts of different ranges there. And it, yeah, it just depends on th- where you draw the line and what you think is is good enough and su- is your subjective ranking there. Yeah, one of the bigger things to mention there is the input device that you're using. So yes, higher latency, uh, lower frame rates. It, it's more acceptable with a controller, or I, I guess the better way to put it is the the, the poor latency is less noticeable with a controller yes. compared to a, a mouse is a much more, I don't know, how would you put it? it it's more precise. It's yeah, more, I was going to say, precise. like, yeah, more precise sort of in, input instrument. And therefore, you will notice straight away as soon as you move the mouse. It, yeah, it's the, it's that weird laggy feeling. It's, um yeah, it's not good. So the input device, and of course, you can use a controller on a computer. We're not suggesting that you can't do that either. And there's some games where a controller is preferable to keyboard and mouse such as a, you know, a car racing game or something like that but yeah i'm it, not I'm, that does have a big impact though like yeah yeah it does like a lot of the reason why i consider 30 fps to be unplayable even for single player games is that if you are playing with the mouse and keyboard and you're moving around and trying to scope out the environment even just look at cool things and move around the environment a lot of the movements that you make with the mouse are very like oh i'm going to turn that way so i'll do it quickly i'll turn Mm -hmm. back the other way and i'm going to turn quickly whereas with a controller you don't have that it's not only just less precise but you don't have as great of an ability to make quick movements it's very much like yeah there are like options to like 180 and stuff but it's more i would say it's more that it's smoother that the initial movement is smoother that's right and less of less of a the mouse almost is um it's too it's sensitive. Al- yeah, it's almost like in in compared to the control, it's almost like every movement's like a flick shot. Like it's a yeah, you know, you're sort of moving all over the place quickly, whereas a, con- a controller mm-hmm. can be smoother. Uh, of course, I'm I'm generalizing, but I think that's in general why a controller does feel smoother than a mouse. You don't know, get that sort of jutting all over the place mm-hmm. type. And that obviously experience. strengthens you know the console 30 fps experience. So people saying, mm-hmm. well, 30 fps on a console is is supposedly playable well you're playing pretty much every game on a console with a controller which is going to change that that discussion significantly around what isn't and isn't playable and yeah like just for me playing a game like starfield for example at 30 fps it's sort of you know first person versus third person can have an impact as well in terms of you know how noticeable 30 fps is and to me playing that sort of game at 30 fps while it is slower paced it is still a shooter and it is very, I found it difficult to play at 30 FPS. It, it increases the challenge and not in a way that's an enjoyable increase in the <laughs> challenge of the game. Like yeah. to me, I like a game being hard and, and needing to understand the systems in the game so that I can master them, get good at them and you know defeat enemies and you know really need to get into things like you know maybe crafting better weapons or something. That's how I enjoy the difficulty being raised, not oh, it's difficult to aim because the input latency is high and I can't really see the enemies because it's so blurry at 30 yeah. FPS with You with overshoot your target enabled. every time. Yeah, and, but even then, like, among single-player games, you know, there are some single-player titles I would class as being close to playable at 30 FPS. Titles like Flight Simulator come to mind, which most of the time in that game you are just clicking buttons, like turning off and on knobs and using your input device to control the plane. And it's very, very, very slow paced. Like you, you set your plane to fly in one direction and really you're not doing all that much else. The game is obviously more enjoyable at a higher frame rate, 
but it doesn't ruin the experience for me like in Starfield where the game is is much more difficult. And last week I think we talked a bit about City Skylines 2 where I, I think that's probably a bit less playable at 30 FPS just because of the, the amount of menus and systems that you have to navigate through. feels a bit sluggish like a productivity app being run at 30 FPS, but certainly I would class that as more playable at 30 FPS than a Starfield or racing game or if I really needed to, Fortnite or something like that. You so, can't, yeah. don't worry about it. Yeah, with these sort of like 30 FPS unplayable discussions, it's the level of sub- subjectivity is extremely high. Like it's very, uh. it could be the case for one game and, and not the case for another. But certainly, yeah, across the majority of games I've played and the way that I want to play, I would class it as unplayable or certainly very unenjoyable. Yeah, I mean, look, we've been talking about this for 15, 20 minutes and I think the... <laughs> The truth of the matter is it's not really a conversation that needs to take place because it is so highly subjective. It's like saying that you think one case looks good and another person's like, that case looks awful. It's just, yeah. it's, and it's not like when people get so outraged by your opinion on this, it's like they're almost acting like you've just had this outlandish opinion that nobody ever before has had. And it's like, Tim, you are mm-hmm. extreme in your opinion here. Like, this is just unheard of. Really, the pe- there's probably fewer and fewer people in the 30 FPS camp these days, like more and more people are discovering or mm-hmm. just becoming accustomed to high refresh rate gaming. And once you go there, you really can't go back. But it, it's not an extreme opinion to hold that 30 FPS is unplayable or unenjoyable, however you like to phrase the term. But mm-hmm. your subjective opinion is it's not good. And you really, when you hear that, if if you are a thirty FPS gamer, you should be like, okay, well, that's Tim's opinion there. I don't agree with it. Let's move on. Like, I'm not going to get hung yeah. up on this part of the video. Let's see. Ultimately, your mm-hmm. opinion there doesn't change the performance you were seeing. So you just ignore yeah. your own opinion on that. It's really not something. It's not a conversation that really needs to take place because yeah, you- and I, I think I think that there are some opinions about thirty FPS that I think are more worrying than others like my opinion doesn't really matter the opinion of end users as to whether 30 fps is good or bad is kind of like as you say whatever like just Mm -hmm. ignore it and move on where i get concerned are things like for example a gpu manufacturer advertising a gpu playing games at 30 fps as being an acceptable experience or alternatively a game developer suggesting that they have designed or optimized their game to be run at 30 fps or on console for example only giving gamers the option to run at 30 fps rather than developing mm. you know a 60 fps mode or something like that the justification there's often we wanted to run at higher quality visuals or something along those lines and sort of more on the what you're being sold side of things that i tend to find 30 fps to be particularly egregious like i wouldn't want to go out and buy a gpu that's being advertised as being like oh play this at 30 fps it's amazing like you can run Mm. path tracing at 30 fps and that's a really amazing experience because i i would disagree it's not an amazing experience despite how impressive the visuals look and similar with games coming out and saying this game is designed for 30 fps it's like well You've thought that, but it certainly doesn't make me more willing to purchase the game. If anything, I'd be turned off from purchasing the game because it doesn't offer a higher performance mode or at least run on you know modest hardware that you'd normally be expecting it to run better than than mm-hmm. thirty fps. Yeah, well, that's ex- I completely agree with you. That comes back to the point I was making about when we're looking at newer hardware, newer games where we're pushing what we can, what we're we're trying, we're advocating for better whatever it is, like mm-hmm. more VRAM. We, we don't want $400 US GPUs with 8 gigabytes of VRAM. Uh, you know, whether it be the race to the bottom in terms of image quality with stuff like upscaling and frame generation and things like that. Um, yeah, we don't, we don't want those technologies necessarily to be sold to you as the key feature of a generation. We want, we want more than that. We want it to be better than that. Uh, and that's the same thing with 30 FPS. We don't want to start saying that you know 30 fps is fine with a a 40 90 because path tracing which you know terrible experience for sure at those kind of frame rates Mm -hmm. but yeah i don't know how that becomes acceptable for some people but again it's just it's it's a subjective thing but we don't want to definitely don't want to see 30 fps pc gaming become a thing that gets heavily pushed for whatever reason like 
Yeah, even and, and that 30 was, FPS is sort of the base frame rate with frame generation applied. So it's 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 sold you as 60 FPS, but it's mm, it's, it's really not. Like, yeah, I mean, even 60 FPS when ray tracing first came out, I was not a fan of like 1440p sub 60 FPS frame rates. I'm like, nope. Like, well, you were lucky to get that back then. Well, that's it wasn't a thing at all. That's right. That was my problem. But if you turn ray tracing off, it's like fairly modest hardware, 1440p. You were looking at a high refresh rate experience, which is the, that was where I was seeing gaming moving towards was this smoother, more enjoyable, better latency experience. And I was all for that. Like I was pumped for these high refresh rate displays and even for single player games, like it just, it, it's mm-hmm. so yeah, much it's better. better. It's, it's visually, it's better. Uh, it, it feels better. It, it's easier to play the game. It feels more natural and then when we started heading just sharply in the other direction, that's, I guess, why I was so unimpressed with ray tracing because, well, I wasn't the only one. <laughs> Gamers were unimpressed with ray tracing at large. We were somehow made to, like, we had to pretend that it didn't suck, that the visuals weren't, for the most part, greatly improved, but the frame rates were more than halved in most instances. So, yeah, I, I guess that's, you're absolutely right. We don't want to be sold 30 FPS gaming. We don't want the next generation of mid-range GPUs to be like, hey, look, it can do 31 FPS in this new game. (laughs) We don't want to see that. I've heard some comments from developers over the years about why they target 30 FPS for some games, which typically doesn't super apply to PC. It's more on the console side of things, like, for example, Starfield only offering a 30 FPS mode. I think games like Gotham Knights, there was sort of a controversy around that being one of the newer or first examples of a ps5 slash xbox series x game that only offered a 30 fps mode i think maybe they later updated it to include 60 i I can't quite remember but basically there was sort of this a lot of games were coming out on console launched with 60 fps modes and then there was this slow backwards step towards 30 fps and a lot of the discussion there was around well i'm a developer so i want to include more graphical features i want the game to do more Therefore, the compromise for that is 30 FPS. Like we can't integrate all these features into our game, largely graphical features, and run it at 60 FPS. Like the the consoles just aren't possible to do that. And there even are some CPU limitations which can come across to PC gaming as well where they've targeted 30 FPS on the console CPUs and then that really does limit what you can achieve on a higher performance PC because the CPU isn't that much more powerful. So, and and I typically disagree with those opinions i think a lot of what's lost in that discussion about we're increasing the visuals and in doing so reducing the performance from 60 to 30 fps ignores that reducing the fps from 60 to 30 reduces your visual quality Mm -hmm. a lot of people uh, some developers some gamers seem to have this thought that by running it at 30 or 60 fps the quality of the game is the same, like the Mm -hmm. visual quality is the same at the same settings, just your performance is higher. And having now tested displays in depth and looking at exactly how they work and how they display frames to you, it's very clear that running games at a higher frame rate (laughs) increases the visual quality. It's not just performance. It's not just lower latency. It's less blurry. And the simple reality is that you know, these days, back in the CRT days, it was a little different because they were impulse displays. So they would display each frame very quickly and then fade away to to black before the next frame was ready. And when you impulse a display like that, you typically only see it for a brief period, which makes it look very clear, but not necessarily smooth. So obviously running 30 FPS on a CRT, it's still not very smooth, like it, it's slideshowy, but you're getting, you're seeing each frame very clearly because it's being just flashed very briefly. Whereas LCDs and OLEDs these days are sample and hold monitors where each frame is shown on screen for the entire period up until the next frame is ready, unless you're using backlight strobing modes. And what that means is as you're looking around the screen and things at motion, your eyes are moving where objects on screen are not moving. And that creates blur. And that's where a lot of people see motion blur and see just even with motion blur disabled, the screen looks blurry at like a 30 hertz or 60 hertz experience. And the higher and higher your frame, your frame rate and refresh rate goes up to 120, 240. I've just been testing a 500 hertz monitor. It becomes a lot clearer. And that's clearly a visual improvement that you're getting. You know, 
in games, for example, even a single player game, you're, you're moving around the screen and there's, you know, billboards with nice, beautiful text and graphics on them. And as you're trying to track them in motion on a 30 FPS display, that looks really blurry. Like mm. even with motion blur disabled, very blurry. You turn on <laughs> motion blur, it's like amplifying how blurry it looks. Well, I'm, I'm laughing at you talking about how blurry it looks at 30 hertz because it's it's just laughable because what was that demo from the Asus booth at Computex? It was like, was it 5, 540 hertz, yeah, something like yep. that? What was that comparing with? It was like 360 or something, wasn't it? Was it was it two forty? Uh, I think it was a lot lower. Maybe it was one twenty. Maybe was it well, okay. Well, whatever it was, it was still it was more of a standard high refresh rate. Yeah, whatever, yeah. whether it was one forty four. I, I don't know. I remember it being. Well, I thought it was quite a high refresh rate. But it wasn't it was, sixty. No, it wasn't sixty or no, thirty. No, definitely sure. wasn't sixty. <laughs> no, that would be. No, I think it was. Let's just say one forty four because it was at least that. I I believe, but mm -hmm. we could yep. go back and find out. And then it was five something. Yeah, um, five forty. I think it was yep. 540, yeah, from memory. And the difference with them side by side, I was it like the Blurbusters test or something like that was running? Oh, oh no, no, it was the CSGO, wasn't it? It was the CSGO I think it was like They'd taken the idea of the Blurbusters UFO test and they had turned it into a, a more gamified version. Yeah, it was like a CSGO Master. themed thing or something. Anyway, it was like, yeah, high refresh rate to extreme high refresh rate. And Looking at them side by side, it was day and night, the clarity. Like the 540 hertz looked insane. Like it was amazing. The image quality was really mm -hmm. good. The motion was just... And I've got that just, monitor now. And let me oh, tell you, it was, it's good. <laughs> yeah, I want it. I want it because it, it looked amazing. And that's from like 144 to 540. And the difference was insane. Um, from that demo anyway, I'd love to get my hands on it and have a play with it. Mm-hmm. So I mean, from from thirty hertz to from thirty hertz to you know one twenty one forty four whatever, like the it, the difference is just insane. Like you, you're doing a complete, you're playing it. You might as well be playing a different game. It's it's that different. Like I yeah, and a I, really I can't good way to stress enough. A lot of people struggle to test this, but I, f I find a really good way to test this if you do have a monitor and you are interested in testing this is go find the utility out there called Smooth Frog, and. In this utility, which is very much for testing monitors, and you're running your monitor in a variable refresh rate state, so make sure that's enabled. It has, it basically is like the Blurbusters UFO test, where it moves objects across the screen that look like frogs, but it's got this slider, an FPS slider that you can very easily change mm. from like 30 to 60 to 120 or whatever. If you're on a high refresh rate monitor, in that utility, start lowering the refresh rate and keeping the motion the same, so the frogs will move across the screen at the same rate but just your FPS and refresh rate will get lower. And you will very clearly notice how much blurrier the image gets once your monitor is running in that sort of 30 to 60 hertz range as opposed to more like 144 or 120 hertz. You will very clearly see how much clearer and nicer the higher refresh rate experience is. And I think that's a really great way to sort of experience what that looks like because often in games, you know, you're sort of, you're moving around, you're trying to get a feel for it and it's sort of, you know it's better, but you don't quite know how or why and there isn't often that really easy way to just take your game from running at 120 fps one moment to 30 fps on another moment so you can clearly uh, examine the differences whereas this utility makes that very easy i think once people see that sort of difference and have tested it for themselves they'll sort of get what i'm saying when i say that it's there is a significant visual difference between 60 and 30 fps you can't just say like oh we're turning on all so many more graphical effects at 30 fps and that that makes the game look better when at the same time turning from 60 to 30 fps makes the game look worse like mm. it, it's that balancing act of how much better are the graphics in the game is that enough to counteract the fact that the clarity of the game is worse and the smoothness which is sort of a visual effect as well how much worse you're making it by making yeah. that decision i think a lot of the time especially today with games that can run pretty good quality rasterization effects, the the balance is skewed pretty heavily into often those 30 FPS modes on console only have minor to moderate visual improvements, but the blurriness is a lot higher. So the, the, there's big question marks there as to whether that, that trade-off has been worth it. Is it worth just making your game look a little bit worse in terms of like the sharpness of the shadows or how accurate the reflections are? Is it worth it just making those a tad worse to get the significantly higher clarity of, of a 60 FPS experience? And I think most of the time, 
yes, it is worth the mm. put it into 60 FPS. Yeah, look, I think the the this conversation really does boil down to people with low end hardware versus people who don't have low end hardware. I think yeah. that's really like there you're not talking to people who have RTX 4070s and high refresh rate monitors. Though I I believe the majority of those people, at least based on polls we've run on the Harbor Box channel, those people are prioritizing frame rate at, at least over 60 FPS. I think mm-hmm. we did a poll once and it was like it was largely what I said, like 90 FPS thereabouts, like somewhere in the 70, 80, 90 to 100 FPS. That was that was the minimum PC gamers yep. were willing to accept. So this this 30 FPS crowd, it is obviously budget gamers. There's not too many people with high-end GPUs. Like we're not talking to many RTX 4070 Ti, 4080, 4090 owners they're enabled path tracing or whatever and are playing at 30 FPS and saying, no, this is fine. Like a lot of those people will be playing at well over 100 FPS. They know what the low latency, high refresh rate experience Mm is. So I don't don't think there's too many people making those arguments. I know you say that, but I find it very interesting, the the console crowd where these days a lot of games do have the option between 30 and 60 FPS via like the quality mode will run at 30 FPS, the performance mode will run at 60 FPS and it often defaults to the 30 FPS quality mode. I find it interesting how many people still prefer the 30 FPS quality mode over the 60 FPS performance mode or simply don't change it. Mm -hmm. I find that interesting because I, I definitely agree with you that Obviously, if you are forced into a 30 FPS experience because you're running low in hardware, then you know yeah, that's so kind it. of the experience that you're accepting. So be it. It, it could very much be playable. But with, in a lot of games these days, like I've just been playing Spider-Man 2, for example, on PS5, that game has a choice between 30 and 60 FPS. Now, I would always choose the 60 FPS mode because in my opinion, it's way better. Oh, yeah. But a lot of console gamers are still saying that 30 FPS... The, that they're preferring the 30 FPS quality mode because the quality of the game's presentation is better. Either the resolution's a bit higher or the, the visual effects are a bit better, and that's the way they want to play. And I I find that opinion difficult <laughs> to understand. Like, I mean, it's you, called You're given the gamers, choice. So. You're given the choice, and you're still not choosing 60 FPS. I don't really get it. I, yeah, I guess maybe are, are we talking about like explain it? is it like console gamers who argue about like whether Xbox or PlayStation's better and they have like passionate hotly debated arguments about that subject as if Probably. it matters because yeah. if it's those kind of people then Tim I wouldn't I wouldn't I wouldn't delve into the minds of those gamers I think that's a place you don't want to go just a hunch um yeah I mean and again, if you enjoy your console gaming or whatever, as Tim does and Balin does as well, then more power to you. But mm-hmm. um, I don't really care to have too many of those performance-related arguments about console gaming. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, just- I mean, a console is obviously a, a low-end experience. Like, mm-hmm. <laughs> I say that now, people are going to be like, but a PlayStation <laughs> 5 is equivalent to this GPU. It's like... Uh, nah. I'm talking about relative to modern hardware. It is yeah. on the lower end. It's it's. I mean, the price itself just dictates where it is. It's yeah, a, it's a you're getting an it's entire a good system. Val- it's a good value gaming system. Yeah, exactly right. So it's, I'm not saying it's bad or anything, but certainly its performance is on the lower end of what's capable today, mm-hmm. which makes sense that they are three years old now. Um, I think you know I've played even recently games on console where there isn't a choice to use a 60 fps mode the most recent i would think of would be uh the legend of zelda tears of the kingdom on the nintendo switch that game runs and i say runs at 30 fps because 30 fps is optimistic in some situations it can run at like 20 fps which is certainly garbage and you know it's it's an interesting I guess for me to sort of sit here and say I find 30 FPS unplayable when I've just admitted that I've played games at 30 FPS. But I guess that's kind of what you were saying previously. It's similar to the, well, there's no choice. Like if Mm -hmm. I want to play that game, Mm -hmm. the options are 30 FPS or not playing the game at all. And for, again, people with lower end GPUs, that's the situation. Certainly for playing something like Tears of the Kingdom on Switch, that's the choice. It's it's 30 FPS. And there are other games as well on, on PlayStation consoles previously, like Red Dead Redemption 2 when it came out. I played that on the PS4, and that was a 30 FPS experience on that console. And I enjoyed the game. Like I came away thinking the game was good, but it wasn't 
related to its performance. It was related to the quality of the game. Yeah. And I think if it was like the the quality of games like Red Dead Redemption 2, Tears of the Kingdom, these are critically acclaimed great games. Like I would see here saying they're excellent games that I really enjoyed playing. If it was more a mid-tier game that I was sort of being like, I'm enjoying this, but it's not like my favorite game. It's sort of, it's okay. I think something like 30 FPS could make me switch off that game if it wasn't like a fluid, smooth experience. If it was sort of like, yeah, I'm, so, I'm, this is okay. I'm, I'm having a bit of fun. It's not great. I'll keep playing it, you know, because of various different reasons. Then, yeah, if that was like a 30 FPS game, I'd be like, nah, there's this other game I'm interested in playing that has the performance I'm after. It might be a bit more fun. I think that's that's sort of where those discussions might go on, but yeah. So what yeah. we've what we've learnt from all of this is it's the language used. So in future, it'd be wise not to use the terminology "unplayable" mm-hmm. and instead say, "I found the experience unenjoyable at this frame rate." Something along those lines. Look, yes. the same people are probably going to be just as offended by those comments, mm-hmm. but I think they're more technically correct. That at least yeah. again, it's it's still a subjective thing. It's still your opinion, uh, but you can't turn around and say, "No, Tim, that was you. You found that enjoyable. You found thirty FPS enjoyable." It's like, no, mm-hmm. I definitely didn't. I played it at sixty, and that was much more enjoyable. And then I played it at one hundred and twenty, and that was more enjoyable again. So thirty yeah. FPS was was unenjoyable to the point where if it wasn't, you, you know. Uh, game of the year type game i wouldn't have played it i would have gone well this is this is a bit unenjoyable this is this is too unenjoyable and the the game itself doesn't make up for this unenjoyable frame rate experience so i'm just going to try a different game Uh, but i I think it's the language used is probably the bigger problem there i think that's fair i think it's interesting as as well like i would class this sort of a language discussion i guess if i said say the 30 fps experience was awful or garbage mm-hmm. or mm-hmm. very bad which is to say to you, me, these are all to things me, i would say <laughs> yeah i would potentially say that as well <laughs> yeah i to me that language sounds more harsh than saying it's unplayable because to me so, saying something's awful <laughs> it's a very strong language right whereas unplayable is <laughs> like maybe not quite as strong or emotive it's sort of more like a technical term yeah. maybe even though we've just admitted that we're using it subjectively i get i so, get what you're saying but you are you are saying without question that this cannot be played at this frame rate yeah awful yeah, I guess or not it can't be done <laughs> yeah so i guess the the closer you look into it the more unplayable isn't it's, really it's, suitable it's, it's, it's very absolute yeah i i agree it's probably better moving forward to say that 30 fps is unenjoyable bad abysmal awful um horrible <laughs> those sort of words um, uh, I'd be interested to see, like, do A B testing on like me saying 30 FPS is unplayable versus 30 FPS is horrible, and what sort of comments we'd get. Like, would we still be getting the comments saying, "Oh, 30 FPS isn't horrible; it's I, I'm enjoying the experience playing at that frame rate," because it, they may just end up replacing, you know. Oh, I think thirty F. I don't think thirty FPS is unplayable. With I don't think thirty FPS is horrible. I, I'm not sure. See what happens yeah, there. I'm not sure those humans really exist like they think they do. Like, I've <laughs> I've had people before say that I've used a high refresh rate monitor and it makes no difference. And I swear, those people were running it at sixty hertz. Like, mm-hmm. there's no other conclusion I can draw because I've actually had a person who said to me, "I tried a high refresh rate monitor." And it was no different to my, you know, 60 hertz monitor. It's a waste of money. It's, it's a scam, basically. And then I showed them 144 hertz. And the second they played the game, they were like, what? What? What is this? This is amazing. And even, I can't remember, you were in the office and we had Balin here. And Balin was saying, for playing a game like Cyberpunk, I could handle, I don't know what it was, 40 FPS or something. Mm-hmm. And I dialed it down to that. And he was like, oh, this is awful. Yeah. It's always going backwards that, you know, in my opinion, makes the most difference. If you, if you're introduced to 120 FPS after you've been playing at 60 FPS, you might go, yeah, okay. I can sort of notice the difference. Like, you know, it's not maybe as big as I was expecting, but it's, you know, it's, there's something there, or even you might get people saying that they, they don't see the difference at all. But it's when you take people back down the other way, mm. so you, you make them play at 120 FPS, then you cut it to 60 FPS. I feel like 
the vast majority of people could notice that difference because going backwards in my experience is the much more significant factor. So mm, yeah, that yeah can with be the true. sort of with the Balin experience, I think it was not so much going increasing from 40 to 90 FPS, which I think he uh, eventually settled on. Yep. It was more taking 90 FPS back down to 40 that you're like, oh, it, it felt smooth <laughs> before, but now it's, yeah, it's, now it's, it's really worse. Bad. And, and I think that plays into as well, like the discussions about the increasing expectations for PC hardware over the years. You know, in a recent q and I, I remember bringing up, you know, previously we were talking about games like The Witcher 3, the difference between high and hardware running at it 60 fps versus lower end hardware running it at 30 fps whereas these days that discussion would be more like 120 fps versus 60 fps and i think that's because as people are introduced to higher performance experiences over time it's much harder to go back you know once you once you move up a little bit slowly over time you're like oh this is a little better and then you know you go from 90 to 110 fps you're like oh that's a little better then you're up at 140 fps you're like okay it's a little better but then you, you're faced with going back to 60 FPS and it's like, absolutely not. Yeah, if I ever so, boot my computer up and Windows is defaulted to 60 hertz, mm-hmm. straight away I'm like, whoa, what's wrong here? Something's gone wrong. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's, it's real bad. But again, this is all... This for me, if I was a budget gamer still buying budget hardware, this would all be really exciting news to me. But like... Yeah. You know, I'd be watching high re- refresh rate monitor prices and seeing them slowly come down. And that's all exciting stuff because it means eventually I'm going to get my hands on this and be able to enjoy it. Like you, you always want yeah, exactly bigger and better things around the corner. Like the worst thing on the tech scene is this stagnation that we're seeing. It just, it, it sucks mm-hmm. for everyone. It sucks for high end shoppers, mid range, low end. It's bad mm-hmm. for everyone. The good news is that monitors haven't stagnated as much. They're very mm-hmm. much getting more and more affordable and, and it, you know even today like again i've been testing 500 hertz monitors i've tested 360 hertz monitors before people have said things like surely that is diminishing returns over what i currently have whether that's 144 or 240 hertz or whatever just wait till you get your hands on some of these once they start getting much more affordable 500 hertz will will make your 144 hertz monitor feel very very slow yeah very, and i don't think slow. that's just uh, yeah like we were talking about image quality this really isn't i know a lot of people are like, oh it's esports stuff that's for you know mm-hmm. counter strike players and, and and what have you and while it's certainly more desirable there or or more necessary i, I would say like Still, for the single-player games, it's going to be difficult to get single-player games up to those frame rates. You'd probably have to go back and play some older single-player games, uh, but a lot of them aren't intended to be played at those frame rates, so that can you know, introduce other problems. But the clarity of those games will just be next level. Like it, It'll be so good. So Yeah, exactly. And that's, where, that's sort of what I was trying to get across in the D- original like DLSS frame generation coverage is that Provided that you're running at a reasonable base frame rate and your latency is okay, and we start getting these 500 hertz, 1000 hertz in the future monitors, then if the quality of the generated frames is good enough and is acceptable enough, then you will start to be noticing a much better visual experience on high refresh rate monitors. It will be Mm -hmm. clearer, it will be smoother, and that's where I see a technology like frame generation really becoming good for PC gaming is... As you say, a single-player game is pretty hard to get a visually stunning game that's often doing a lot on the CPU as well, running at 500 FPS. Like, the engines just aren't designed for that. But Mm -hmm. if you can get it running at 100, 120 FPS, and then you're using frame generation to fill in the gaps up to your maximum refresh rate, you'll be getting reasonable enough latency for playing those single-player games. The experience will be enjoyable from that perspective. But then the clarity as well of your super high refresh rate monitor. And that, that maybe still be many years away like 500 hertz is not affordable for 1080p monitors today so it's not like you're going out and everyone's upgrading to that just now but at some point that is where those technologies will come into play and it will be a much better more enjoyable experience for single player gamers and will show the benefits of a high refresh rate for single player not just for Mm -hmm. your sort of multiplayer gamers which is sort of where i see things going i guess but i mean again even today the difference between 60 hertz and 144 hertz for single player games is just it's night and it's, day it, yeah, it just big, is yeah, like it's, I, a, it's a good improvement I, I i'm not sure there's a human that won't be <laughs> able to you know that that has their eyesight and all that sort of stuff like i i don't think there's anybody who's not going to be able to spot the difference like it's just that it's that different it's insane there's one other topic that i probably wanted to t- chat about briefly towards the end of this podcast and that is 
the interesting situation surrounding Alan Wake 2 only including DLSS and FSR upscaling modes. They do not have a native... Well, they do have a native mode because you can run DLSS or FSR at the native resolution, so you can just turn them on. It either uses DLAA if you're using the DLSS path or it uses FSR2 at the native resolution if you're using that path, but it doesn't come with a native TAA mode like we've seen from a lot of other games where you can turn off either DLSS or FSR and just uses the the built-in technology. And I want to ask you about how you, if this continues to be how we see games launching, how are you going to approach the testing of these titles? Like, would you just mm. be using FSR2 at native when talking about like 1440p performance because FSR2 runs across all GPUs? Or how, how are you going to approach that sort of thing? Not sure, to be perfectly honest. Uh, probably, well, try to do whatever is closest to native for for GeForce and Radeon GPUs, whatever that ends up being would be probably the goal. Again, if we're testing with FSR2, which would be default for Radeon GPUs, and then DLSS, which would be the default, like, say, quality modes for both of them, as we've been saying, like, that's a disadvantage for NVIDIA. Ironically, like, NVIDIA pushed all this technology to give themselves an advantage, probably Mm -hmm. in benchmarks. And if that was the goal... In a way, if we were doing that, it would have backfired because AMD is able to match or beat them at that game in benchmarks by just offering a lower quality. And even that is like, that's another subjective conversation because there'll be people that argue black and blue in the face that FSR looks as good or better than DLSS, which we don't agree with, but mm-hmm. it is a subjective opinion, right? Like <laughs> it's yeah, it's the same sort of problem. And, th- and that's why we've always been you know native is king that gives you an accurate baseline for when things are Mm -hmm. apples to apples of how they actually perform and then you can degrade the image quality as you see fit to improve the performance from Mm -hmm. there so would you like alan lake 2 you can still use the fsr2 path on an nvidia gpu if you wanted to yeah is that the sort of way that you would configure the game for your basic benchmarks, maybe you'd include I mean, like DLSS and FSR as well, or would you go DLSS, <laughs> you just do DLSS on one and FSR on the other? Well, look, by choice, I think the absolute best way to tackle that would be FSR 2 at the native resolution on both GeForce and Radeon GPUs, because mm-hmm. I think that's the fairest, most accurate way of testing. And we tried to do that in the past, and we got absolutely roasted by NVIDIA fans mm-hmm. for, for, you know, apparently testing NVIDIA GPUs at a disadvantage when that absolutely was not the case. And if anything, it, the opposite was true. So I, I don't know what we do there. Like, yeah, the, the accurate smart thing, in my opinion, would be to test them apples to apples, both using FSR. I don't care that you're going to use DLSS it, because at the end of the day, the numbers should be roughly the same. It's just the image quality. But again, there are instances where FSR could and we have seen improved performance a bit more than DLSS because the image quality isn't as good. But generally, they scale from the same sort of resolution. But there could be instances where we don't see that. It opens you up to just misleading benchmarks, basically, which is why we tried to avoid that. Yeah, it'll be bad if they go down a path where you know NVIDIA, you're forced to use DLSS, and then on AMD, you know obviously you'd oh, be because as you said, it'll, be, it'll just be a race to the bottom, won't it? Because yep. we've already, it'll be, you'll just have Radeon AMD fans saying, no, the image quality is fine. And then AMD will lower it a bit more. And then, yeah, mm-hmm. it, it just becomes a nightmare. So, yeah. And I think games not including a, a native TAA path is also doing a disservice at times. Like testing games like Immortals of Avium, Forspoken, even Starfield, which allows you to use FSR2 at the, you know, native resolution, Alan Wake 2 even to some degree. You know, FSR is not a perfect solution for TAA anti-aliasing at a native resolution. Mm-hmm. Like it's the goal of that technology was to be used for upscaling. And while you can use it for native resolution anti-aliasing, it still typically contains a lot of the issues that we've seen with it when upscaling. Things like mm-hmm. flickering, um, the you get better detail 
well, it's not really reconstruction. You get better detail when running it at the native resolution, but often you will see some of those like, yeah, flickering pattern effects, shimmering, a bit of sizzling, things like that, which again, some games, the native TAA doesn't have those issues and DLSS may have its own set of different issues. Things like, again, you may, typically you don't see shimmering, but if they're using the wrong or incorrect DLSS preset in the game, you could see a lot of ghosting in the, in that game, where, whereas they should be using a slightly different preset. And often the way to get around that is to just switch from using DLSS to the, the native TA presentation. Of course, TAA isn't typically optimized for the upscaling path, so you, use a, you lose a lot of detail by using that when as with just your standard resolution scaling, which is why it's not sort of the, the optimal solution for that sort of thing. But yeah, I, I feel like games should probably, until we see... FSR improved to the level where, you know, the native quality mode is offering a really solid, good experience for all users, then, yeah, I feel like Alan Wake 2, as an example, probably should include a native TAA path because I wasn't that impressed with the FSR 2 native path. So I, I guess that will depend game by game as to how well, you know, an FSR 2 native looks. Mm-hmm. But, yeah, it not only makes it difficult for testing, but potentially isn't giving gamers you know, the, the optimal experience in the, in those sort of scenarios. So yeah, unless there's some sort of technical reason for why it can't be, can't be implemented, then it, it should be implemented. Like you want more options, not less options, especially on PC. Yeah. I mean, I can see why developers are going down that path. Like, you know, if they're saying, oh, well, we need some TAA type of anti-aliasing for native resolution and FSR is now offering that as an option then, and it works on all GPUs, then okay, we'll just put that in. We won't bother implementing, you know, a third option, which is that sort of native TA implementation. I could see why developers would choose that because it would save them time and development resources. I don't necessarily know whether that's like the optimal choice for gamers, at least with the the quality that we have with FSR at the moment. Now, I probably have to look a bit closer into like exactly how native FSR looks because it's not always bad like i sort of made it i guess made it sound like it it looks bad compared to a native ta that's not necessarily true uh fsr does have quite substantial gains for things like sharpness and and detail in some areas because you know some ta solutions can be very blurry often with fsr that isn't really the case so it's probably more of an investigate that one and look into it a bit more closely but yeah it's going to be interesting for testing and interesting for gamers moving forward if what we see with alan wake 2 becomes more of the more of what we see which i think probably will be the case mm-hmm. it's hard to know for sure but i think probably something along those lines will happen so we should probably take a break at this point and yeah have a little sip of water and talk about our boring lives okay steve hit me with the updates Update. is your life boring or not boring this week oh, i guess it depends on uh your personal interests. Uh, not much has changed since last time. I'm still working on that project where I'm building like um, like a garage shed type thing under my deck. Uh, it's mm-hmm. like 15 meters by four and a half meters. So pretty big area. It's going to take a lot of time, but I've had it concreted. I've got the roof done uh, and sort of most of the external cladding is done. I've just got to sort of uh, seal it all up inside. So I've installed the roller door, done all that. But I bought a few new tools. So buying new nice. tools is always exciting and fun. So I bought, uh, of course, they're all DeWalt because that's the ecosystem I'm in. I've got about a 1,000 DeWalt batteries. So <laughs> don't really want to go with Milwaukee or something and, and do that all over again. Uh, but they have a, you know how you've got the, I think you've got a, ten, uh, I think it's a 10-inch sliding drop saw that's, Mm-hmm. 20 volt or 18 volt in australia yeah, yeah. 20 volt if you're american um it's the same thing though um so i got the 12 inch version of that sliding drop saw miter saw um okay yeah so that's really cool it's 54 volt uh so it just uses one 54 volt battery and yeah works really well i've been using that today for the first time very mm-hmm. cool I not also, a, well, it's not a sponsor, but maybe we should get them to sponsor us. <laughs> I, I have a, 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 yeah, I don't know if I should talk about the pot. Oh, anyway, we'll get to that in a second. I also got the 54 volt leaf blower and okay. it's the, 
uh, it's insane. So I had I had the original 54 volt leaf blower, which worked pretty well. I use that for cleaning my asphalt driveway now and then, and, and blowing away sawdust and mm-hmm. a variety of uses. And I thought, ah, oh, I, I could get this one almost for free because it was like they did like the the Dewalt bucks. Like if you bought X amount of tools, you got money back to spend on more tools. So I was like, mm-hmm. whatever. And I, I was buying these things anyway, so I ended up getting like six hundred dollars. So I bought like the um, I think it's the twenty volt gurney, um, like a high pressure washer type thing, and uh this leaf blower and yeah this one's insane like actually insane it's very loud and it shifts a lot of air like it, it's pretty impressive i was pretty shocked by how powerful it is so well, yeah, i've got it, just the 18 volt one and i've always thought that that's plenty powerful enough for my uses so getting well, the have, 54 uh, volt one is- I'll, I'll, I'll show you my original 54 volt which was pretty good and this new one is it seems like it's at minimum twice as powerful like it's insane so I got that now, uh, and yeah, just a few other bits and bobs. But anyway, I've been playing with all the tools. I guess I'll tell you this part, and I don't know, you can edit it out if if you feel like it, it needs to be edited out. But uh, uh, I, I won't say any names or anything, but a friend of the channel works at a power tool store, a retailer mm-hmm. that sells power tools. And uh, the DeWalt representative came in to the store. And he was like, hey, I know this guy that is into PC tech and stuff and occasionally does like the odd building project on his channel and he uses DeWalt tools pretty much exclusively and he has this shed with like this awesome DeWalt wall you should take a look. So we showed him and the guy was like, oh, that's awesome. If he ever needs anything, tell him to contact me. I'll hook him up with the latest tools and stuff. And I've never been that keen to do anything like that because, you know, I buy all my tools anyway and we're not a tool channel um, and I don't and there's really expectations, wanna... right? Like if, yeah. you, if you're getting provided something, it's it's not like they're just giving it to you. It's like, what are you yeah. going to use it for? That's right. But I thought, you know what? I, I have a serious amount of money at this point in time invested in DeWalt tools. I've been mm-hmm. in the ecosystem now buying their tools. They're like 18. They're, they're sort of the flex volt range. You know, you can do the 18 and 54 yeah, yeah. volt batteries on the, and again, for American viewers, it's 20 volt and 60 volt, but same thing. Uh, and occasionally I have like a, a you know a battery die or something, and it's a pain in the backside to like get warranty and that. So I'm like, hey, having a Dewalt contact could be really useful. And um, it was really funny how it went. So I emailed this guy who said, you know, email me, gave me the, his details and that. And I emailed him and I, I sent him a couple of videos because we've done a lot of behind the scenes content for our Patreon slash Floatplane members where I'm showing off the new tools that I've bought and showing mm-hmm. a couple of projects that we don't do on the main channel. But of course, I built like my desk and my entire studio using DeWalt tools and we did the same at your place. So I sent him those videos. I also sent him the live stream where we use the gyroscopic drill, which I love. Best, mm-hmm. but hands down, one of the best tools I've ever owned in my entire life. I've had it for probably about five years now. I use it daily and it's not skipped a beat. Original uh, original battery, really good. Love it. It's like eight volt or something. It lasts a long time. Like I use it for, I don't know, a month or two before I have to recharge it. Maybe, yeah, two or three months. And for doing, you know, motherboard routers where you're changing CPU coolers constantly, it's just awesome. Anyway, I sent him the live stream. I think it was one where you were showing the audience it and stuff like that. I'm like, you know, we've 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 shown this tool off a lot and that. Anyway, long story short, he replies to me with an unexpected reply. He's like, he's basically, I sent him all of these videos using a whole variety of DeWalt tools. And he replies to me saying, oh, next time, can you please just use tools that we sell in Australia? The gyroscopic drill we don't actually sell here. <laughs> wow, that's weird. So I replied and I, I replied to him and I was like, okay, I appreciate that. But like, I bought these tools with my money. Like I could have used any brand, all right? Like it's still, yeah. it's still brand exposure. Like I could have used Milwaukee or Makita or someone else. I basically said to him, I'm like, well, it's still DeWalt exposure. Like it's still, I'm showing off a DeWalt tool that I purchased, mind you. Like 
Come yeah. on now. Like maybe I, like, sell it in Australia as yeah, well. And, and I said to her, I said, it's like one of the best tools you guys make. Maybe look at bringing it into Australia. So rather than complain about me buying it from the US and using it daily and loving it, maybe take that information and bring the tool into Australia so the thousands of people that have asked me about it can actually go then buy it. Um, but I just thought it was a really odd response. And then I've not, I have not heard from him since. <laughs> So I mean, he was, you say that's odd. That sounds exactly like a sales you know, rep. <laughs> yeah, you know when like we review a product and the review is largely positive. So the, mm-hmm. in the conclusion, we recommend the product. We say it's good, mm-hmm. and then the first email we get back from the person who sent us the product or is from that company will be like, "Oh, I saw your review. Now I watched it." 10 minutes, 31 seconds, where you said briefly that some minor aspect of the product is not good. Um, Yeah, we want more information about that, just completely ignoring all of the positive stuff that we've talked about or even, you know, our general recommendation. They'll hone in on like the one negative thing and be like, I wasn't happy that you said that one downside to the product. It sounds exactly like that. It sounds exactly like that, except for the fact that it's way worse because, because A, bought I bought it, and B, said nothing negative about it. <laughs> like, I don't care because I didn't want free stuff anyway because, as I said, I, I've probably got, I don't even know at this point, $30,000 worth of DeWalt tools. Mm-hmm. Um, I've saved significantly more money than that using them. Like, the amount of mm-hmm. money I would have saved is insane. Like, some of the projects I've built, like just my desk, for example, it cost me... $2,000 in materials to build that massive desk. Now, to get a carpenter in to have him build that for you, you look well over 10 grand for that kind of that, that size furniture. Um, mm-hmm. You know, I've had friends who had little like coffee table things made at the entrance, custom made out of just standard sort of hardwood, and it's cost them $1,500 and it's like 60 centimeters by 30 centimeters. So, having a eight meter long by what is it, three and a half meter desk made up. Um, Good luck with that. So anyway, they've been great. I've, I've been buying their tools for a long time, but it left a bit of a bad taste in my mouth when this guy's like reached out to me saying, contact me and I'll, I'll hook you up and that. And I've, I've sent him some stuff where we've genuinely used like for my desk build, I used like DeWalt screwdrivers, DeWalt clamps, DeWalt planer, DeWalt sander, DeWalt circular saw, drop saw, like drills, impact drill, hammer drill, like the amount of DeWalt tools I used on those. I think collectively those videos have about 400,000 views as well, the two videos I did Mm -hmm. on my desk setup. And I used like a good portion of their 20-volt range. Um, He didn't mention anything that. He was just upset that I used the gyroscopic drill. So so funny. So, yeah, um, I'm happy to just keep buying the tools. But it would have been nice to get some sort of – I know – you don't a really want the whole. Or something or... Well, I I shouldn't want any sort of special support because you know Joe Blow just has to go through, you know, back to the retailer when a, you know something dies and fill out the form and wait weeks for it to be replaced. And admittedly, again, like I, I'm not paid by Dewalt, but I've had basically nothing from Dewalt fail apart from like you know batteries that are three years old or something, but still just in warranty or whatever it is. Yeah, I mean, yeah. it would have been like, you know, obviously you're just buying them at retail. I'm sure, you know, big construction companies get retail, you know, trade prices and things like that. Even something like that would have been sort of nice, but. Yeah, I mean. It doesn't really make too much of a difference. Yeah. if Look, if I made a product um, and I came across someone who'd, someone just who wasn't, you know, a corporation or a big business, just some, you know, weekend warrior <laughs> it, 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 hardware enthusiast, let's say that uh, that buys my tools, and they bought a substantial amount of the tools. Um, had been a loyal customer to the brand for well over a decade, uh, and 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 I bothered to interact with them. The interaction would have been very different. Um, it, it, nothing has made me want to buy Milwaukee tools more than that interaction. <laughs> like I was, I, I was tempted to just be like, sell them all. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not that spiteful, but if I was, I would have sold all my DeWalt tools and then bought Milwaukee instead. Um, and I've there's a lot of good Milwaukee tools. Like if I started again, might go Milwaukee. 
Um, but I'm too <laughs> probably too far down. They've they've got me now. You're they've not got just me. you're not just too far gone. I've seen the amount of tools you have, <laughs> and that it's enough tools for your entire town to use. Yeah, seriously, yeah, right? I could supply some towns for sure. You could supply some towns with your your collection. So yeah, but <laughs> so, bit too far gone. A bit of a weird weird thing there, but you know. I'm, I don't think that's probably reflective of the entire brand. It's probably just that you know, no, more no, of an that's individual right. thing. Yeah, um, yeah. Well, that, that's what we've always talked about with the PC companies as well, haven't we? Like, you know, we, hmm. MSI, for example, they were nowhere six, seven years ago. Like, we couldn't get a thing from them, especially mm-hmm. when I was at TechSpot. And then, you know, they got some new employees and they're just amazing. Like, they're honest. Yeah. They're really, really good employees. Um, and so... You know, people see us working closely with MSI, but it's not necessarily because we prefer the MSI brand. It's just because there's good people in place and some of their competitors are much more difficult to deal with. And maybe it's not even the people that we deal with directly. It could be just the structure of the company that, you know, they they either allocate less to our region, which, you know, we are a smaller region compared to something like the US or Europe or whatever. But anyway, it yeah. It could have gone differently if I had have got uh, a, a different a person. But anyway, whatever. I, I didn't take it personally. I just thought it was very odd and quite funny. Yep, that's a pretty interesting interaction. It will be interesting to see whether you can find someone else there that yeah, does eh. things a bit differently. Whatever. This week, I well, on the weekend, I had some family over and we did a big um, sort of yard day, like a, Ooh, a working nice. bee type thing. I had some... So it was nice weather, very nice, mm-hmm. very very moderate temperatures, nice and sunny. Went out and did yeah, a whole bunch of gardening. Had some trees that had blown over and things like that, just broken branches and things that hadn't bothered cleaning up yet. Yeah, had some people over, all fixed that up. Did some did you use the re- of fruit did you use trees the reciprocating and, saw? Did you use the reciprocating yeah, saw for, on, your, on, on the trees that were down. So it works pretty well. Again, that's okay. a DeWalt tool. So that's right, good. Well, we got that in. I just want to give us the model number and everything today. <laughs> I did, couldn't even remember off the top of my head. The reciprocating saw, though, is great for cutting palm tree fronds. Very mm-hmm. efficient for that. I've got a few palm trees at my place. And mm-hmm. yeah, cutting through those, the dead ones, is, is very easy. So yeah, now I've got this big pile of stuff that has to be burnt. And yeah, the some of our fruit trees that have got a lot of fruit growing on them at the moment have shored them up from some. Uh, invasion of birds and things as they they ripen up so that would just be for me which is good mm-hmm. um so yeah that that was a lot of fun but unfortunately a couple of days ago in more annoying news not this is news this is very boring i okay, have good my the range wood in my kitchen the extractor fan died so oh, i've had no. to <laughs> yeah i had to have to source another one that said again i'll probably be using some dewalt tools to be unmounting it and mounting the new one Miller Walkie now. <laughs> yes, I'll have to go replace, do the, your, what you're suggesting, do the full replacement with uh, Milwaukee or something like that. But anyway, <laughs> very annoying because yeah, I tried yeah. looking for like re- just replacement parts for the, the motor assembly that's inside that mm-hmm. actually does the extracting because the rest of the range hood is fine. Like it's not, you know, rusted or anything. It still is perfectly fine. Mm-hmm. But basically, yeah, you can't source that specific component anymore. The, the model is... Dis, you know the full range of itself is discontinued so i you know an electrician mate that i know i'm like hey do you have any better sources for things like this you had a look no nah, unfortunately just yeah, that one component isn't available which is pretty annoying because yeah obviously like the cost of replacing a range hood the entire unit which is what i've had to end up doing versus just that one particular part is is pretty significant and you know at least it is you know there's a lot of talk these days about right to repair like you want your components and stuff to be easily repairable Mm -hmm. this component is easily repairable which is good and it's not that old like i would estimate the age of it to be about 10 years old but yeah you just can't get that very specific i guess exclude like they must have used Mm. an exclusive part for it or something you just can't get that part so you know right to repair is all well and good being able to service it yourself but if you can't get parts for things that you know you well, I think get- that all comes under the right to repair, though, right? That's what I would have thought because, like, yeah. I, I'm not sure what the laws and regulations are in Australia. It's Again, I, it's probably a bit better than the US prior to their right to repair laws, but it's all well and good having, like, replacement extractor fans available for a unit that's two or three years old, but how often are those types of units failing? Like, I wouldn't expect something 
like a kitchen appliance that three, is three years old to necessarily be failing all that often. Whereas, yeah, when you get to units that are more 10 years, 20 years old, and those parts start failing, that's when you'd be expecting the failures to happen. So not having those parts available is a bit is a bit frustrating. That said, if I had a different brand or type of range hood, then potentially those parts would have been available because maybe they used just more generic parts or more widely available parts. The range hood I had was kind of more of a niche type design and things like that. Mm-hmm. But luckily, I managed to find a range hood that looks basically the same, managed to order it. It's coming in a couple of weeks. I'll be able to install that. But for now, no range hood in my kitchen, which is kind of annoying. So yeah. anyway. Well, those things do suck up a lot of like grease particles and that, which can kill yeah. them. Um, obviously, they're designed to deal with that, but some will do it better than others. But a pro tip, since you're going to be staying in your house indefinitely, mm-hmm. uh, would be to find out what motor your range hood uses and maybe buy a spare one before it's discontinued for when it dies 10 years into the future from now. That That is a good point. To be fair, though, I did manage to get... Unless it's a, very expensive. I managed to get a really good deal on the on the range hood, though, from mm-hmm. uh, something that looked basically the same. I think the brand I was going with, they've just introduced like a new series of range hoods that, in my opinion, looked worse. I don't really care mm-hmm. about the performance of a range hood. It doesn't matter all that much. <laughs> but it visually was less s- close to what I currently had, which uh-huh. meant that the the older models that, you know, they're still brand new, but the previous series were on like massive discount. So mm-hmm. that was a nice sort of okay, it died, I had to buy a new one, but it wasn't like, oh, I had to spend like $5,000 buying mm-hmm. the exact replacement. I managed to get a, a, a pretty good deal on the, on the new one. So, so it wasn't a complete disaster. It wasn't a complete disaster. I've probably only been out of, you know, I don't know what a motor would have cost, but it was probably ended up about twice as much to buy a whole new range hood. So The motors not, probably not, aren't cheap, to be honest. They're probably the bulk no. of the cost. Uh, there's probably a bit of stainless steel there and stuff, but... When you get the new one, if it looks like it's easy to change the motor, see what the motor is. <laughs> and if it's cheap to buy a spare motor, maybe buy a spare it. motor, seal it up, put it in your garage and have it for a yep. rainy range hood day. Yeah, it's probably good advice because there's been a few things that have sort of needed replacing over the, the the journey so far of owning my house. Like just just things like the, the battery in my um, garage door motor. Like it's got a, oh, it's got a, okay. it's got a battery fail safe battery in it. Yep. Yeah. And eventually I had this warning that like the battery had worn out and stuff. And I was like, okay, you know, I was able to buy a replacement for that pretty easily because they still make basically the same type of battery for new units. But yeah, if something, you know, that particular type of battery wasn't manufactured in like 20 years from now, then I guess I just have to sacrifice that functionality. Yeah, so, you would. Either you buy a new motor. Yeah, I mean, still, like it still works without the battery in there. It would be very yep. frustrating if it was like a requirement to have it in there. It does still work and function mm-hmm. quite quite fine. But yeah, just those sort of like annoying little, yeah, things seem repairable at first, but then you dig a little bit deeper and yeah, just part availability is probably more of a concern. But anyway, mm-hmm. that's my next couple of weeks having to eventually when this arrives, install it, get rid of the old one, wire I- it up because it's hardwired yeah. in and things like that. I'm just laughing at you because I can imagine you rigging up your garage door to a UPS. <laughs> <laughs> Whenever the power goes out, your garage door starts beeping. Uh, yeah, uh, that, that would be funny. Very much overkill. And I, I guess I'd have to like ceiling mount it as well. Yeah, so you would. It, uh, yeah, there'd just be some wall brackets and you'd have a, a UPS up there. I, I mean, it would work, right? It would work. That said, I've never had to rely on the battery backup. Our power supply, even though I yeah. do live a bit more rurally than i used to live has been very reliable most of the time Whereas that's because you've got a battery backup though well, the, second you don't, the second you don't have one and yeah. you need to get in there the power yeah. will go out you, it'll be some it big works. storm and it'll be like raining heavily i'm like yeah. oh damn it's the power's yeah. out but, and the one uh, thing you need in there to save something is, yeah, is exactly. in there <laughs> You have to uh, you have to cut a hole in your uh, door with your reciprocating saw, or well, um, that's actually in the garage though. So oh, I'd be I'd be out of luck. Yeah, yeah. You just have to drive through the door then with your car. Yeah. Hey, at least you don't care about your car too much. Maybe that was the plan all along. That's was it, right. Was it, well, it, it was a car or a battering ram, whichever you needed. I think I could reverse in because on my car I've got a tow bar that I've never been able to remove out of it. It's like a little bit rusted in, and yeah, yeah. my partner just the other day, hit her leg really hard oh, into the toe right at the back. Yeah. She was it, she was very frustrated about it, that. It's, but it's shin height as well, so it really hurts. Yeah. 
Oh, and another thing uh, as well, in my Alan Way 2 video, I mentioned that I took the Titan X Pascal out of my partner's PC to oh, use yeah. for that video, which yeah. w- that wasn't a joke or anything. That was actually what I did. Uh, <laughs> but the thing is that I I maybe forgot to put it back oh, no. and she needed to use her PC for like a meeting in her office at home um, just the other day. And it was like two minutes before this meeting and she's like, my PC won't turn on. I'm like... Oops. <laughs> I don't know why that could be, but give me two minutes so yeah. I can probably fix it. Yeah, unfortunately it took a bit longer than two minutes, so she had to go to a, a backup a different PC. Oh, no, but um Tim. Oh, I copped it a little bit there. So yeah. a bit, bit of fall fallout from the old stealing of the uh, of the components in there, but maybe in return I will upgrade it from a Titan X Pascal that is now pretty low end, low lowish range uh in terms of performance, and I'll, yeah. I'll give her something a bit more modern, maybe. Okay. Yeah. So there you go. So, yeah, I guess that's it for the Hardware Unbox podcast. I said it was episode 11 at the start. I'm still going to go with episode 11. Okay, do it. We'll I commit now. We'll I just rename accurate. all the other ones. We, yeah, we, we'll might, have, we, might, we have to start at negative one or something. Yeah, that should work. That should be just <laughs> fine. So, yeah, Hardware Unbox podcast, episode 11. Thanks for listening or watching to the end. Uh, if you do want to get the audio feed, and typically these episodes do go out earlier in the audio feed, so if you're watching the video version on YouTube, that can be a day or two days after it's published for the audio feed. So the audio feed's always first if you're interested in in listening to it through there. But yeah, got the audio feed, the YouTube channel, Patreon float plan if you want to head into our Discord and chat about the podcast and things like that. And of course, the best place for feedback is on the YouTube video once that's up. So if you're a a lover of 30 fps gaming you want to explain to me why you're a console gamer and you choose the 30 fps mode instead of the 60 fps mode for your games then leave a comment in the youtube uh video once that is up yeah that's pretty much it thanks for listening thanks for watching and we'll catch you in the next one